Whoa. Oh my God. Now this, that's a view. Overlook of Fort Mountain. Came up for the walls and a potential stone thrown. Stay for the phenomenal view. Wow, what a day for it. Look how far out. Look at all the trees, the other mountains you can see. Wow. That's, let's go something. Don't worry, you're safe, I got you. God, you see all the roads out there and everything. That is, that is an amazing, amazing view. He's uh he's seeing if we can figure out if anybody else knows where the stone's thrown is they got a lot more trails up here now so we haven't found it yet we'll keep we'll keep looking got about another 20 30 minutes i'd say before we have to go Whew, wow that's a that's a thumbnail if i've ever seen one of my right Ooh. High atop Fort Mountain are the rocky ruins of an ancient stone wall, with prehistoric origins steeped in legend. Generations of archaeologists and historians have unsuccessfully sought to unravel the riddle of this wall, one of several stone assemblages scattered throughout the southeast. More than 150 years after its discovery, answers still evade us as to who built the wall, when and for what purpose. Theories abound, and one of the most realistic explanations is that the wall was built around 500 AD by a tribe of Native Americans for ceremonial or religious purposes. Others assert the wall was built by wandering bands of Welsh explorers during the 14th century as fortification against Indians. Welsh Prince Madoc has been credited with building several stone petroglyphs in the southeast after supposedly sailing into Alabama. Another theory, based on Cherokee legend, is that the wall was built by the Moon Eyes, a race of light-skinned people who could see in the dark because of their larger or paler eyes. Or perhaps Spanish conquistadors, possibly Hernando de Soto, built the wall as a defense against Indian attacks. Since no artifacts have been found to support these theories, no one knows who built the Wall of Stones, zigzagging across the southern face of the Cahota Mountain Range's most prominent peak. This part of the southern Appalachian Mountains rises above the Piedmont Plain and offers 80 mile views, making it an ideal location for ceremonial practices or defensive needs. The stone wall runs east and west for 855 feet and its height varies from 2 to 6 feet. Archaeologists believe it was much higher before exploration and plunder by previous scientists and treasure hunters. Adding to the mystery are 30 pits built into the wall. Were these gun emplacements or symbolic to some ceremonial practice of earlier inhabitants? Will the secrets contained within these stones forever remain a mystery? Even the Indians had legends of these funny people that did not match their Phenotype. Yeah, the the moon-eyed people that you were talking about. It was. Um, yeah, they call them the Alagui or the moon-eyed people. Yeah, they're yeah, supposed to be like kind of big, pale, bug-eyed yeah. looking people, aren't they? Let's see. How would this? They call it a fort, but it's like, what would you be protecting? Yeah, and why have it stretched for so long? When no matter what, you have to think about. Like you said, it's way up, way up the mountain. I mean, we're right at the top. Because you're almost at the top of the mountain, so all you'd be protecting is just the cap of the mountain. There's no yeah. water, no nothing. So. I mean, who's gonna who's gonna bring a massive invasion force all the way up here? Why? What will be the purpose? It's supposed to be one thing if they had precious minerals around or something, but there's no evidence or talk of that. No, they just mentioned the wall. And it is just a lot of funky rocks that they've used now, for the used entire world. It used to be a wall, but they've let people play on it over the years where they've just knocked everything down. It's like, why yeah. did they do that? It's big. That's just a tree. Looks like it's just naturally had a had a bad day. And it goes on down that way as well. That. It's like, what's yeah. the purpose of that? It continues snaking. Yeah, why? It's definitely not natural. There's there's no denying that. 
So why, why the wall? It's not even like it's a tall wall. And here's even another one. It's like there's multiple. It is strange. Because yeah, it'd be, it'd be one thing if it was a tall wall. That definitely makes you think of defenses, but this is it's, it's more like just a feature, isn't it? Some kind of like a, makes me think of like a snake-like one that they would, uh, the other, other ones have found. Oh, I keep getting bugs on me. Okay, I think it was right along in here. So oh, the uh, the stone chair. That has a sort of a sitting place, but what I remember, it had a back and a. Right, more, more chair like. Yeah, it was definitely more chair like. See, and there's another extension of the wall going down that way. Huh. There's some impressive rocks. Huge. I mean, comparatively speaking. There's tons of them. It's even just, it's, it's just crazy. Yeah, it looks like a cave under that. Yeah, one. it does kind of look like a little cave. Might have a little, might have a little nose. If there's an animal, then we, uh, <laughs> then we won't. <laughs> There's nothing really dangerous around here, so unless you got a drop just, of lighter or a fentanyl lighter. Yeah, just just the people. Right, it doesn't really look like it goes very far in. It's more like just a little cover. But yet again, I think it just kind of happened. Yeah, it doesn't really go in or deep or anything. Oh, here's one of the things I was going to point out to you. Another tree down. Yeah. I don't know if they have them in England or not. Oh. So when you go along the highways, especially around 285, yeah, you can see the cut marks. Oh. So they cut, and then there's a perfectly straight layer, and then more cut marks. Oh, yeah. It's like, what would have caused that? Yeah, certainly. That's interesting. It's picking it really well on the camera. That's great. That is... I'll try to stay out of your way because I know you don't want me in the picture. No, you're fine. It's it's just video. You're all right. I can always cut you out of stuff if you don't want to be in it. That's not a problem. Well, I don't care if I'm in it. I just didn't want to bother your pictures. No, no, no. That's that's that looks great. Nothing wrong with that. I've just been rolling video for a few minutes now because I can always just cut anything not necessary. But I think a lot of it's fine. <sighs> Fort Mountain. Very interesting. Still no sign of our chair. Well, we'll see if we find it. Worst case, we don't, but we still saw a lot of the interesting rocks. Yeah, maybe. Because it goes, it goes all the way around. You said there's the tower on top as well, and that guy mentioned an overlook, so there's, there's definitely a lot of stuff here. There's the continuation of the stone wall, just there. We're walking alongside it right now. Whew. Oh, it's nice to be out and about again. I haven't done this since uh, since Cornwall days. Well, no, actually, I think I did some in Castleford. But nothing is substantial like the Cornwall stuff. That was good. Checking out, like, abandoned bunkers and stuff. It was oh. nice. Tons of them down there. Tons of old military installations. It's very cool. Wow. A lot of damage to some trees. Wonder if the hurricane did a bit of that. I don't know. I would imagine, maybe, but. It's more grown up looking than I remember. Yeah. It's, like it's been 20 years, so there's a lot of. It's very, very grown. This kind of stuff wasn't here when I was here last time. Yeah. Still on a trail. There's a wall here, and yeah. there's also a wall down there. That's like, oh, so like a second layer further down. Interesting. God, it certainly goes a ways. They were doing something. Whoever, whoever it was. Whoever, but it's like the thing is, there's theories. And we could tell you the theories, but, you know, we'll, we'll do a bit of research, see what else we can find. As to who has done it. Oh. More stones up there. Oh, 
There's a big stone there. Hit myself with a twig. Ah, tower. The Firewatch Tower, very high up in the mountain. I guess you get a big, big view from that. That'd be amazing. Oof. Yeah, even the trail goes that way as well. Double blue diamond. It's just some kind of a trail marker, but it was making me think of black diamonds like I'm skiing. I was like, that'd be a... I'm not ready for that. I can barely ski. Back up hill again. Oh, our, our favorite. You're only going to see pictures of, of us climbing up to reach this area, but it, there, there was a lot. We are we're already pretty exhausted. <laughs> but hey, it's, it's good for us. Oh, blue marker. We're just a punk-ass kid. Oh. Trash. Don't do that. That's mean. Nature can't do anything with a tin can. European fern. Heart stain fern. What it's doing up here? I have no idea. Yeah. Somebody brought it. Doesn't just magically appear in a completely different country. God, look at that. That's so interesting. A lot of lines. Now what I was pointing out about those cut marks is here you can see the natural striations. Yeah. That is a natural occurrence. But cuts at a 45 degree angle are definitely not. No, 100%. What is that pile of rocks? I don't know. The, the big kind of weird round one. Oh, I don't know. It's like, where did they come from? Because we're on the top of the mountain, so it's like, where did they roll from? Yeah. Hollowed out tree. That's cool. One takeaway I get from this, now, I don't know how they got on top of the mountain, uh -huh. but the fact they look like they all rolled. I guess multiple big rocks rolled. From, from the, the very top, yeah. Is back in the day, they may have had an earthquake here because this place is geologically active, they say. So it's like every so many thousand years that that happens. But for all these big rocks that look like they've been tumbling, they may have had an earthquake before settlers got here. I guess it's a possibility, especially if there were less trees at the time. Yeah. Or it could have took down the trees and they died and these are yeah. all, because these all look like young trees. Hmm, that's a good point. They're not the strongest looking trees. Okay, here's one of the things I was pointing out. That is granite, and that is limestone. The two should not be together. Especially on the top of a mountain. It's like quartz. Maybe maybe deep underground, but not on top. You well, know? what forms granite and what forms limestone is two completely different igneous rocks. So it's like, those are not the same material. That is... You gotta hand it to nature. Always knows how to make things look nice. <laughs> Starting to turn fall up here and it's not yeah. really down right. in the valley yet. Yeah, not even not even further down the trail was it starting to turn yellow. <laughs> Just an FYI. A lot of these old trunks you see like this was when we had the American chestnut trees. Ah. And they had the uh, chestnut blight come through and right. wipe out all the American chestnut trees. Yeah. So now all the chestnuts that are grown here are either European or Chinese. 
you think this might be one of the pits that's mentioned in the uh, in the story? Because they, they say there's like 30 pits along the wall, but they couldn't figure out what the pits were for, whether it was uh, like ceremonial purposes or some kind of defensive emplacement. Well, it looks it's like certainly it was deep. Out. Yeah, it's Water got kind of. Water wouldn't have done that because there's rocks on this side, so where would the dirt have gone? Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost a, a circle in a way. It's going to be hard to see if you can see depth through the camera, but uh, yeah, certainly interesting. Could be one of the 30 pits they mentioned in the uh, the pamphlet I was reading. Wouldn't it be weird if we found Bigfoot? <laughs> been looking for a chair and seeing Bigfoot sitting in it. <laughs> I think people might have to pay for that. Get out of that chair a minute. I got to take a picture. <laughs> Bigfoot, be real cool for like three minutes, all right? Tower and North Face Loop. Okay. Hi there. First off, I'd like to thank Luther for taking me to Fort Mountain to show me these mysteries in the first place. When it comes to the the, the wall, and we also mentioned a stone throne and things like that. Sadly, we didn't find the stone throne while we were up there. Uh, he, he's been to it before, so he has seen it, so he, he knows it's there. It's just we, we couldn't really find access to it. Maybe like it was off of a restricted trail now or something. Either way, we couldn't, we couldn't reach it. And uh, also, upon researching online, I found nothing. I found nothing about it. Nothing about it at all, which is a bit of a shame, but, you know, it is what it is. So today we're going to focus on the main mystery itself of uh, the walls of Fort Mountain, Georgia. I hope you enjoy. Let's go ahead and talk about the um, the, the Spanish theory. The um, Specifically, Hernando de Soto was the one they mentioned. And he did have an expedition from Florida that went up through the, uh, the mainland through Georgia, I think a little bit of Tennessee, and then west over to, like, Alabama, and a little bit of Arkansas, potentially, is, is what was proposed. I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of cover a little bit of that based on uh, based on my findings. So, uh, he did indeed leave Florida. He was uh, basically told that there's lots of gold up in the mainland. And he's like, oh, amazing. Okay, so I'll take my expedition upwards. Uh, he encountered many Native American tribes, and we have four different chroniclers of his journey. Sadly, two of the chronicles aren't around anymore, but two of them still are. And uh, that's what I was able to do some research. It was pretty exciting, I've got to say first account of the expedition to be published was by the gentleman of Elvis, an otherwise unidentified Portuguese knight who was a member of the expedition. His chronicle was first published in 1557, and an English translation by Richard Haclute, ha ha Haclute I, I, I'm so sorry, I'm butchering the name, was published in 1609, and it just so happens that that is still readily accessible. Now, going over the manuscript translation in conjunction with the proposed route of his expedition based on the Charles Hudson map in 1997, we begin to paint the picture. He does indeed embark on a crazy quest with his men to various Native American villages. Uh, they call them towns in the manuscript. Uh, with names that are the same slash similar to the map, which helps us kind of see what's going on and basically follow the route. Really, really helpful, I gotta say. Now, once we reach chapter 17 on page 70... We see the journey leaving Coca slash Kusa going further south, and they do encounter a wall in a town called Ulibahali. However, according to historical records and a little bit of uh, Google searching, and even going through a, a different website, the, um, the Georgia Encyclopedia, I, uh, I found out that Ulibahali is now present-day Rome, Georgia. Which, if you look at the map here, a little, they're, they're, they're a little far away from each other. They're, they're just, just a little too far. Because Rome isn't on the mountain in question. So, that can't, be, that can't be that one, right? The specific wall they mentioned in the manuscript. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, they also said that there's a possibility that he, he had people build a wall for him. And that, that's a possibility. However, however... The entire time that he's in North Georgia, at least according to this one chronicler's manuscript, nobody builds a wall. Nobody builds a wall. So I'd say, at least in my own opinion, we could probably rule out Hernando de Soto. One theory on the wall's origin comes from a letter by John Sevier, a Revolutionary War hero and the first governor of Tennessee. 
The letter, a copy of which is on file at the Georgia Historical Commission, recounts a 1782 conversation Sevier had with the then 90-year-old Okono Soto, a Cherokee war chief at the time. He told Sevier that, um, that they were a people called Welsh and they had crossed the Great Water. And he called their leader Modoc, or uh, in some cases it was, it was known more like Madog or Madoc. Which, if true, fits a little bit closer with the, uh, the Welsh theory about the Welsh prince Madoc in the 12th century. You see, Madog, or Madoc, depending on uh, which source you're looking at, landed in Mobile Bay, Alabama, took his men up the uh, Alabama River, which also then turns into the Coosa River. And uh, what's really interesting about the Coosa River is it inevitably goes all the way up and connects into what is today Rome, Georgia. It does technically also go a little bit higher up into like Tennessee and everything, but it's just a very interesting coincidence, right? And uh, along the way, they kind of had... Uh, some Cherokee friends and everything, and they were making allies, but they also, as you can imagine, had uh, problems and enemies as well. So they would build stone walls and fortifications, which uh, some are still kind of their remnants these days. Uh, the Kusa... Uh, uh, never mind. Supposedly... The, uh, yeah, okay, we've done that. <clears throat> now, the, the important thing to note is that although they did end up going all the way up to Tennessee following the river, which, uh, if I go ahead and show you a little bit of that here... Well, I find it really interesting because it, it certainly goes fairly close, if you ask me. The fact they, they did quite a number of these these weird little wall fortifications, in some cases villages, all along this uh, this river stretch, which is quite something. Like I said, it ends all the way up in Rome, Georgia, is supposedly the, the route that they had taken, well, at least just based on that river. But it does go, yet again, up further up into uh, to Tennessee. And I find it very interesting because this is, a, uh, this is a map of a stone fortification of mounds done by them. Right, and this is uh, it's on the Ohio River through miles east of Charlestown in Indiana, which which is one of the places they ended up going. And if you look, if you look here, it's quite interesting. It's really, really interesting because they've got this uh, this interesting natural stone wall, artificial stone wall as well. But there are these uh, these circles, there are these circles, these mounds, if you will, that are that are along the wall. Really interesting and similar. Now, yet again, does this prove one hundred percent that it was uh, the Welsh that did this? No. No, I would I would say not. And inevitably, the uh, the, the 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 Welsh people uh, from Maddox tribe, some of them integrated with uh, with other Native American tribes and everything. And inevitably, they kind of ended up over the years developing a modified tribe, if you will. Let me let me find the. Here we have a, a report by George Catlin, a 19th century painter who spent eight years living among various Native American tribes, including the Mandans. Declared that he had uncovered the descendants of Prince Madog's expedition. He speculated that the Welshmen had lived among the Mandans for generations, intermarrying until the two cultures became virtually indistinguishable. One uh, one very interesting thing is that uh, certain people noted and supported his theory simply because the Welsh and Mandan languages are weirdly similar, and that the Mandans easily respond when spoken to in Welsh. Another interesting uh, connection is the fact that um, the, the Mandans use these uh, these interesting boats, which the Welsh also used not not entirely but the uh, they're called like coracles really interesting kind of real curvy boats really interesting connection that really interesting connection is it possible that there was a big welsh influence as to uh as to why the uh, the fort mountain wall is there maybe it was some kind of a welsh defense position but inevitably it says that the the welsh were pushed out westward based on cherokee attacks it's a possibility not 100 percent convinced but I think it's a lot more convincing than the Spanish connection, anyway. Our third and final theory is where things get interesting. It delves into the realm of mythology, right? The the Moonite people. This uh, I'll give you a quick little synopsis as to, as to what they're supposed to be. Let's see. They're, they're a legendary group of short, bearded, white-skinned people who were said to have lived in Appalachia until the Cherokee expelled them. Seems pretty simple enough, but but the problem is... Uh, the problem is, so... Upon doing a bit of research about the Moonite people, uh, I stumbled upon a, a website called NorthCarolinaGhosts.com, and they they have a little insight into the Moonite people, which is great. Uh, there's a couple of different websites I'll, I'll end up mentioning as well. But the problem is, one of the first lines they talk about is there is absolutely no historical or archaeological evidence to support the tale of Prince Madoc, even though the king, his father, is a real enough historical figure. There's no sources, there's no evidence that Madoc or Rurid are any of his sons. Which, 
seems like it's a problem, but when you really break it down, just because Madoc or Madog or whatever isn't real doesn't mean the Welsh didn't go to the New World. There's still quite a lot of evidence that there, there, were, there was a Welsh, uh, whether you want to call it a settlement or a, a discovery cruise or something like that. They, they did go to the New World around the same kind of time. They did land in Mobile, Alabama. They did essentially start making their way up the river and everything. So whether Madog did it or didn't, doesn't really matter. The Welsh still did, which is good, which doesn't fully disprove the Welsh idea. Still not 100% convinced as the Welsh, but, you know, I digress. The, the Moon Eye people certainly took me down a, um, a bit of a, 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 a small rabbit hole. I wouldn't say it was anything too insane. I mean, the, the more that you really read into the stories, it kind of talks about different different theories, different potential Welsh people and everything that could be connected to. But I think the, the problem is that we really need to talk about how the the specific description of the, the Moon Eye people, I think, is where our problem really begins. Let me... Because they're, they're, they're these, these they're, they're, they're pale, they're, they got like incredibly blue eyes or very light eyes, which are apparently incredibly weak to, to sunlight, which is why they, they're moon-eyed. So they, they do stuff at night instead of the daytime, which makes you think of like uh, people with a light sensitivity, for example. But in some descriptions, but not all of them, they also have beards, which is interesting because it doesn't really say about a color of beard, but the, the bearded, bearded white people, basically, right? Which a lot of theories then connect to, oh, well, could it potentially be Welsh? Maybe maybe just the land was far too bright compared to Wales, and maybe that's why they had a light sensitivity and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I, I suppose there's a, there's a weird connection there. It's a possibility. But there's not enough evidence. There is this, um, there's this interesting statue that was found, which they say depicts moon-eyed people. It's uh, on display at the Cherokee County Historical Museum. You can check it out yourself. And it's, it's interesting, but... They have, like, flat faces, and I don't, I don't really see the the connection. I don't. I really don't. Based on the description of the Moon-Eyed people, I don't really see it, but, hey, what do I know? The only problem with, the, with further information about the Moon-Eyed people is everybody has the same information, right? It all just kind of leads us into the same point where uh, they, they, you know, have, have been kind of doing their defenses, building up as much as they could. Not really a whole lot is known about them, besides the fact that they end up getting attacked by either the, uh, the Cherokee or um or a different a different tribe entirely and kind of moved out of the land westward funnily enough just like the welsh so yet again the moon eye people in the welsh yeah they, they could be they could be the same but yet again this is still we're talking like nearly a thousand years ago you know so it's it's hard to say it's really really hard to say uh yeah but they do uh, based on the um the account by the uh the, the chief that we mentioned who talked to sevier they that supposedly the the Welsh, the the people from the Great River, were the ones who built the the wall, the walls because they they were making little settlement settlements and stuff, and they were trying to defend themselves. They were trying to build up their civilization. Didn't really work out as per usual, probably because there was a territory clash with other with other tribes or whatever. But either way, they didn't really last. We don't know what ended up happening to the people. It just sounded like they were kind of pushed off the land, and that was basically the last we ever heard about it. I think the only way to truly know more about it is to find, um, potentially find some, some people who could very well have been related to some of these tribes and see if there's any oral tradition left because I, I can't find anything else, sadly, about the Moon Eye people. They're definitely kind of delving into the realm of, like, uh, like cryptids and mythology and bizarreness, but I have not found a whole lot of evidence about them. So it's, it's yet again, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, it's an interesting idea. We don't know how true it is, sadly. We've gone over quite a few of the theories. I, I wanted to kind of go through some of the sources simply because ultimately I personally believe that Native Americans were involved. No, no matter how you look at it, Native Americans were either involved or it was entirely them. Uh, do I know the specific tribe or anything? No, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I did find that, that there's quite a lot of sources that kind of corroborate a lot of this information, a lot of things that weirdly line up and don't fully disprove all the other theories. And uh, one, one such website that I'm going to show you, this is uh, by nativestones.com. Really interesting. And uh, so they talk a lot about like Native American wall designs and everything. Really interesting, really interesting stuff. But they, uh, there's this bottom part, which really, really intrigued me a lot. And it's, uh, it's links to native wall resources. And it's specifically, I mean, not all the links work anymore, sadly. But a lot of them would take you to different websites, which kind of talk about very interesting, similar connections, which sound incredibly familiar. 
And uh, one of the first ones on here is Fort Mountain State Park. How funny, right? The wall at Fort Mountain is a simple rock wall running for 855 feet and ranging from 2 feet to 6 feet in height at different points. It's not known exactly who built the wall or why, but the construction date is estimated to be somewhere between 500 BC and 1500 AD. Similar walls have been found in Bartow, Catoosa, Dade, DeKalb, Habersham, and Whitfield counties in Georgia, at Lookout Mountain at Tennessee, and at DeSoto Falls in Alabama. Now, you know what's really interesting about DeSoto Falls in Alabama? That's near Mobile Bay. And what else is really funny, right? What else is really funny? There are these Welsh caves in uh, DeSoto Falls, which were believed, not 100% proven, but believed to have been... Uh, Done by the uh, the Welsh expedition led by Prince Madog. Really funny that. And do you want to know why it's called the Soto Falls? It's because of a, a certain Spanish explorer that we were talking about earlier, Hernando de Soto. Isn't that all super funny connections? Anyway, so yeah, you've got a big variety of all these different things, including Fort Mountain, Georgia. Which, I mean, just yet again, leads more credence into the fact that it's probably Native American in origin. Does that mean there were other potential Welsh, Spanish, maybe even British, French, for all we know? Who knows? It's a possibility that this wall was even used multiple times. We have no idea. Maybe there was even more to it. it it's it's hard to say. But based on, the, based on the footage that we got and everything, and even just exploring the wall and all the stuff that we found, it could have been taller. It could have been bigger. I mean, in certain places, it definitely goes a little higher than you'd expect. Not crazy high. It's definitely not quite a wall anymore. It's definitely more of a feature these days. Uh, I did find it to be just bizarrely interesting. I mean, no doubt about that. The fact it's over 800 feet long. So it really does feel like there's a big purpose to it. You got the uh, the weird pits slash mounds, if you will, which made me think of cairns at first, maybe spots for cairns. But yet again, there's not real much evidence of, of stones in some of these things. And not all the pits are there anymore. And some of them are covered up and everything. But, um, but I found it to be interesting. I did. For, for all we know, it could have been like a, like like sites for housing, perhaps. Maybe there were like 30 plots of land that people lived in or something. It's, it's hard to say. It's I haven't been able to find evidence of like everything or all the things that people think. There's, there's a fair few theories, but no matter what, they always kind of run along these things. And I'd say the vast majority of them support the Native American theory. And I think that's sadly kind of, kind of it. That's probably the big mystery of Fort Mountain. Is there crazy much to the mystery i don't i don't really know I, I don't feel like this needs a crazy vast investigation i think it's interesting i think it's certainly something it's something i've never heard of that is for sure living in georgia for the majority of my life but then again i haven't been to everywhere in georgia either georgia's huge there's tons of things in georgia i've never heard of and uh there's certainly a fair few things we could still investigate uh let me know let me know what you think let me know down below if there's any specific places in Georgia you'd like me to uh, to further investigate, to check out. I know there's um there's one I'm looking into right now. It's either in Georgia or North Carolina. I haven't quite penned it down. I do know of one in North Carolina, but apparently there's one in Georgia. And it's this uh, it's it's like a plot of land where things don't grow, like grass doesn't grow and stuff. It's kind of in a in, in a forest, if you will. And uh, apparently it's like a devil stomping ground kind of a thing. And weird things happen if you camp there. I think you know what I'm getting at. <laughs> anyway, we'll keep you posted on some of that. Because that'll be quite fun. I'd like to do a little overnight investigation of something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, if you would like to see more of the kind of behind the scenes, maybe more of the footage and everything that I haven't used in this video, I will probably connect it to a... Uh, to, to a video which is just going to have all the, the video footage and pictures and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, we'll just kind of we'll just kind of have a bit of fun with this. This has been uh, what could be the first of hopefully many of Nate Investigates. I like the sound of that. It's got a good ring to it, doesn't it? I think it sounds great. I really hope you've enjoyed, and I really, really hope you want to see more of these. I really do, because uh, I'd, I'd be quite excited to investigate more places. All right, boys and girls. I've been Nate at night. You take care out there. Thank you so much to my YouTube members and Patreon members for all the love and support. Thanks to people like you that we can keep growing.